birthday. This is so exciting. Um, I realized that, oh, we are recording. Oh, good. I forgot to push recording. That's good because other people are on it. Ha ha. Uh, we planned ahead. Um, I realized that yesterday I did not acknowledge our funders for the Sustainability Education Alliance. Um, and I'm very glad to do so today because it is really exciting that we have contributions from uh, the Department of Education as well as the Environmental Trust Fund. And even this year we have a project from TD Friends of the Environment Foundation. Um, and it's, I mean, we're, we're all very grateful for this support that we're able to make this programming happen. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the territories that we are on today. Uh, and a territorial acknowledgement is something that is, you, you hear often, um, that gets brushed through very quickly. Um, and today I would like to not do that and inv invite everybody to think really hard about what a territorial acknowledgement is and about the potential of being able to include that in your class programming. So I'm going to share a couple of links in the chat. One is in English. This is a teacher's guide for creating a land acknowledgement with your own class that is meaningful and takes time. To, and it's a very good exercise um, to bring in. And this is a resource in French. So when we're thinking of a territorial acknowledgement, um, une rec reconnaissance territoriale, c'est important de... Think of that, it's important to reflect. It's important to reflect and, and to uh, properly describe your intentions. Uh, for this territorial acknowledgement, it is to really put this issue at the forefront rather than as something that is a checkbox. Um, c'est important d'exprimer votre gratitude. It's important to express your gratitude. For me, my gratitude is founded in the realization that if it wasn't for the lands on which I live, I'm just feeling a little bit uh, self-conscious explaining this in my second language, so I'm going to switch to English. My apologies. Um, my gratitude is in knowing that I am safer here than in the places that where my ancestors fled from. And that gratitude of having this land be something that supports me is my personal, what I would like to personally share about this today. Um, it's important to specifically name the nations. Uh, and sometimes this can be confusing because there are places where you can look up what the place names are. For example, I live in Amlamkok in the district of Siknikt, uh, in Mi'kmaq territory. So we're smaller and smaller bubbles going, or larger and larger bubbles extending out. The Mi'kmaq are part of a five nation alliance called the Wabanaki Confederacy. Um, the five nations that make that up, I would love to see if anybody can name them in the chat. Um, please go ahead. Um, the five nations making up the Wabanaki Confederacy. I've already given you one, it's the Mi'kmaq. Um, and these areas are governed by the Peace and Friendship Treaties, which are um, not deeds of sale. They are um, treaties to uphold for being in relation to one another and being in relation to the land itself. Yes, Wallastuk is one of, or one of the five nations. So Mi'kmaq, Wallastuk, Pasamakwadi is a third. There's two more. I'll just give it a second. Um, and from there, it's also important to remind everybody to learn more about it. So if you've never read the Peace and Friendship Treaties, I encourage you to do so. They're very short, and you might be surprised at how short they are. Um, it's something to engage with every day on how we can be treaty people, and not something to necessarily just think, oh, it's a check mark and it's done. And then to also recognize the displacements that have occurred, um, the powers that have been forcibly taken away and the powers that still remain for the first peoples of this land and recognizing who um, is going to engage and wrestle with that at any given day. And hopefully the answer is all of us because that is something that we should all um, be recognizing as part of our right just for being here. Um, so this is an example of my off-the-cuff territory acknowledgement. 
Um, this is something that you can do with your class spanning days, weeks, um, maybe even a whole semester or school year um, to be able to come up with one. So I really recommend this practice. Um, okay, yeah. So we have quite a few people here today. Um, I would love it to, oh, you know what? We never quite finished here. So Wolastikwe, Mi'kmaq, Pasamakwadi, the two that we we're missing, well, the Wabanaki Confederacy, Les Abenaki, the Abenaki people, and also Penobscot, who are over in kind of northern Maine area. Okay, there we are. Um, yeah, good work, everybody. Um, J'aimerais vous, uh, vous inviter de vous uh, introduire dans le chat. I'd like to invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat box. Uh, today we're going to have a, a chance to speak to, with each other later on after we've uh, listened to a super panel discussion with experts and invited guests. And also, I would like to remind you that these, this uh, session is being recorded today. If you would prefer to keep your, maintain your anonymity, you can just uh, push, uh, push stop video. It's not uh, mandatory to have your videos on today. So if, um, if you have any concerns or problems with the recording of this session, let uh, the New Brunswick Environmental Network know and we can find a solution for it. Yeah, I think that's all of my housekeeping. Um, so moving on to more housekeeping. First, I would love to talk about my program. Uh, my program is C, Sustainability Education Alliance, l'Alliance pour l'éducation et la viabilité. Um, ça fait presque trois ans que je It's almost three years and I'm coordinator of uh, the C program. Um, and for all of those that are new to this platform, it's uh, new to this platform, I'm going to give you my explanation that is centered on the, the image of a tree. So I hope the uh, the cord is long enough. It's long enough. There we go. Although the New Brunswick Environmental Network is a beautiful tree in New Brunswick, we are a nonprofit organization. We have uh, several uh, caucuses and, and initiatives and collaborations. For example, a biodiversity. And Clara is the coordinator of the biodiversity team, watershed. Myself and Leah, we are we are part of the Sustainable Education Alliance. It's a big branch right here. I'd also like to just pause here for one second in my explanation, because today is Leah's second last day on the program. Could somebody spotlight Leah, please? Um, so what I would love to do, especially for anybody who's had contact with Leah already and her magnifique skills, um, please give her a round of applause if you have a trouble if you have trouble with muting or with a lot of sound then lower your volume and otherwise please unmute and everybody give her a round of applause right now i would appreciate a giant cacophony <laughs> yay <laughs> maybe the sound doesn't really work and it just sounds like me <laughs> it's a little golf clap um, thank you so much, Leah, for all of the work that you have put in over the past, um, the period of your contract, and I have lost all sense of time. Has it been five years? I don't know. Um, yes, hooray for Leah. Thank you so much, everybody. <sighs> okay, so going back to Sustainability Education Alliance, Le, le Beau Alb. Okay. I muted myself. That was amazing. Um, nous avons l'arbre et les so branches. We have the tree and the branches. And the branches. The, uh, the uh, Sustainable Education Alliance is this branch. And below that branch, we have our team, our collaborative team. We have the teams that we have are we have uh, professors, teachers, um, people that work for various organizations that, that represent the government, the school districts, things like that. So the teams we have, keep that in mind because later on, we are going to have opportunities to speak amongst the, those teams. So we have art and sustainability education, a sustainable development education, Exactly the right 
Je, je blâme de moi, hein? Our school gardens team. And a brand new team called Peace and Friendship Alliance, unfortunately only available in English at the moment, where we are going through the Peace and Friendship Alliance book club, rather, excuse me, um, which is a reading group um, spearheaded by Chris George, a Mi'kmaq educator at University of New Brunswick. And he is helping people to understand the legal and treaty uh, foundations that Indigenous peoples in Canada deal with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and the ways that, um, that those uh, legal realities change things. Um, et j'oublie une équipe, c'est lequel? I'm forgetting your team. Which one is it? Which team is it? I'm forgetting. Yeah, no. That was it. Okay. So, on a les équipes. There you go. That was it, I think. Oh. Um, pro uh, professional, professional. And, and a professional development team. So, with all of these teams, oh. uh, avec toutes ces équipes, on a eu la with chance. all these teams, we had a chance yesterday uh, to speak. Uh, after uh, amongst themselves after the panel discussions and the teams did some super work to establish a foundation uh, uh, of thoughts of ideas solutions that were presented yesterday uh, leah if i can give you the opportunity to speak about all that thank you very much zomi so yeah yesterday we had uh, some excellent conversations and we're definitely looking forward to having uh, more excellent conversations today. Uh, when asked the question, I'll just jump right into it. Uh, so yes, today's prompt for our breakout sessions will be different than yesterday's. Um, just to have some diversity in the sort of ideas and conversations that we're having. Uh, so yesterday's prompt for our groups was, what environmental impacts have we seen since the pandemic, good and bad, what does this tell us about our role as human beings and the information we teach to students concerning sustainability? Uh, so a team professional development uh, made some very excellent points. Uh, they said that teachers need more professional develop time, development time uh, to further develop the skills necessary to effectively teach students in these contexts. So the context of sustainability um, and the community impacts that can arise from crises like the recent pandemic. Uh, they, they also suggested that more departmental support uh, is needed in this area, um, that, more, that most PD days are in fact spoken for um, at the beginning of the year as the district implements uh, different programs. Um, and sometimes these uh, topics don't always fall under their, the agenda. Um, so there, there's been a call for that. Team school gardens. Uh, so team school gardens said that in response to this question that uh, virtual isn't necessarily better. Um, so a lot of our uh, curriculums and our programs have shifted to online virtual platforms, uh, but this isn't necessarily always better. Um, there's a lot of screen time, less outdoor time. So those are things that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, School Gardens team also said that the government has more money than is projected. So this uh, pandemic has shined a light on some of the funds that are uh, available to us when we need them and when there's a demand for them. Uh, so don't hold back and maybe be more outspoken in calling for those uh, for that aid and that assistance. Uh, and they also said that we need to address single use disposal plastics and other waste uh, that have sort of increased with the uh, sanitization, the cleaning processes and different things that have come along with the pandemic. Uh, moving along to team art and sustainability education. Uh, they suggested that schools are micro communities and teachers are pressured to accommodate many different needs and demands um, when supports and services fall through. Um, and so, so more support is needed to support our teachers as they go about uh, filling in the role uh, and the gaps um, that scenarios, crises like this can present. Lastly, uh, team sustainable business education uh, they uh, identified that uh, the ecological benefits of the pandemic um, and the intersecting sustainability inherent to that is something that maybe needs to be uh, taught more in schools and brought more to students' ears. 
uh, that beyond the surface of environmentalism, such as pollution, waste management, and et cetera, uh, that we can look further into systems like worker rights and human rights, um, quality of life, regulations, environmental systems, and how these are operating around the world. Uh, so with that said, um, I believe that was it, yeah. So those were, um, those were the remarks that uh, our teams came up with yesterday. And as I mentioned, we will have a different prompt for today, but I'm confident that uh, we'll get as much from that as we did yesterday's. Um, with that said, we are now preparing to hear from Terry Ann um, Larry, who has graciously uh, provided us uh, with a presentation that they've created uh, and that they're going to share with us. So without further ado, uh, I will hand the floor to Zomi and Terry, and thank you. Thanks so much, Leah. Um, yes, I'm just about to get uh, Terry Ann's presentation. Terry Ann is the principal of Natwakanig School, and um, well, Terry Ann Larry, I should say, is the whole name. Uh, mm -hmm. And we are just so lucky to have her here today to talking to be talking about the programs um, that have been going on there. Um, oh, and one last thing, just about the the teams. Um, I think Clara has some links to drop in the chat there. Um, yes, perfect. So if you're wanting to know more, that's there we go. Um, there it is. So it's not in presentation mode. I hope that's okay for everybody. Um, because it is a PDF. How does this look? Is it okay? Good, perfect. Take it away, Terry Ann. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. And uh, just to go uh, talk about what you previously mentioned, uh, Narawaganeg means um, the place where they spear eels. So, um, so what do pandemics teach us about teaching? Um, I really like all of your solutions, Leah, that you mentioned. Um, and I totally agree. As a leader, I think that we really do have to move towards some of these solutions. And I do believe we can find a way in our current education system. Um, I didn't, I didn't expect to say that, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, so I've been a, a principal for three years now and a teacher for about, well, since 2002. And um, my background before that was in uh, Native Studies and um, Anthropology, culture, you know, uh, in cultural anthropology, uh, that kind of thing, uh, literacy. Um, but um, I, okay, I think I'm moving on. I think we can go on to the next slide. Great. <laughs> okay. Um, so just as uh, Leah mentioned all of the solutions, I think um, for us at our school, um, we definitely felt all the same challenges as all the other schools here in New Brunswick. Um, I just feel like um, that basically what the pandemic has really shown is that the current standard way that we teach is really not fitting all of our students' needs. I don't even think it's really fitting the, the adults' needs. And again, I'm going back to what Leah just pointed out, all of her solutions. A lot of what she said was um, how the adults are feeling, how the teachers are feeling, all the pressure, you know what I mean? Uh, to kind of, um, I guess, to teach all these expectations. And again, I can see both sides too, because it's true, like as, as a leader, you have to, you know, kind of push the curriculum, but then at the same time, you really have to take care of your, um, your students, your parents and your teachers. So um, for us, I think the pandemic really emphasized all the gaps too. Um, but it, we're gonna be talking about solutions today. So, um, for us at our school, uh, of course, going right back to truth and reconciliation, going back, uh, really going back to the body, mind, and spirit, and trying to, to um, um, just trying to, to foster all of those parts of all of us um, is really what we try to do. And um, and the reason why I mentioned truth and reconciliation is because 
every time I talk about education, I always have to go back to residential schools. I am a descendant of a residential school survivor. My grandmother uh, went to the school and when she was three and didn't leave until she was 13. Um, I learned a lot about residential schools and not necessarily from her because she didn't talk about it. Not the people didn't talk about it, right? So we're kind of on this journey to kind of bring forth a lot of these things, but again, solution based, we're trying to heal, move forward, uh, make some connections, you know? So um, the pictures that we kind of showed here, uh, just to show pre pandemic era, this is what we really wanted to do was to just bring in the, the parents more. And again, uh, that goes back to, I know it's uh, so many who had <laughs> move forward, um, uh, but one, one point before I move on is just to kind of touch on uh, parental engagement. And that was really hard for me too, as the principal, uh, to say, no, you can't come in, uh, you know, because of the pandemic. And because uh, and, that's so deep rooted uh, when our, you know, uh, relatives went to these schools, they didn't have any parental uh, guidance, any, any, you know, they were, you know, um, taken from the homes and, you know, everybody knows uh, the background story. Um, so trying to find more unique ways to involve the parents was really a challenge. Um, so it had to push the teachers to try to get out there and kind of create that connection. Okay. Um, so again, just highlighting all the body, mind and spirit. I just, because I don't have a lot of time, just wanted to highlight our um, Geluk Mijipchewe, uh program, which is where we explic explicitly teach about nutrition and, uh, you know, providing the kids with a healthy breakfast, uh, snack and lunch program. Um, and again, as you see in the quote, uh, the, 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 I guess the background to that is really going back to the survivors and some some things that we have learned uh, is that a lot of the survivors uh, were not, um, they weren't uh, properly nourished and in some cases starved just so that they wouldn't run away, you know? Uh, so we really want to acknowledge that and then, um, and to purposely explicitly teach about nutrition, what good foods do to your body. And because uh, I feel that's something, and not just me, uh, we feel that it's something that, um, um, uh, I don't want to use the word raw, but it probably is appropriate. Um, but you know, we, we lack uh, some parental skills we lack some a generation or two that we you know or even more that we didn't have that parent to child kind of you know um bonding anyway so i can uh if if, if anyone has any questions about that later uh, you can certainly ask me so we can move on to the next slide um so this is uh and to just to go on with purposely uh teaching about um uh, nutrition, we also have to, um, you know, address food security. So part of that is really um, uh, teaching the kids about how to grow their own food, how to harvest. Um, we um, were actually, we had, so, during the pandemic, it was interesting because we do like to encourage everybody to come and uh, take from the garden. And, but this year, it was uh, really cool because one of the the parents uh, made a meal out of the out of the produce that they got from our garden, and then, and they shared that on Facebook. So um, we said this year we're going to really kind of promote that, and uh, you know, kind of ask send that out there. Hey, what did you make with the you know with the food from the garden? That kind of thing. And uh, one thing that we're really missing here from the pandemic too is we usually have a big harvest. Uh, feast and what we did before the pandemic we were starting to couple that with uh, um, solstice ceremonies so we would have uh, the equinox uh, we have a sweat with the with the, some of the older kids so we come back and have a feast and invite everybody and we'd have a big kind of you know lots of activities and that kind of thing so that's definitely something we would like um, to um, to get back to after this um, so during the pandemic um, you know, uh, again, going back to all the challenges, 
uh, when when all the shutdowns happened, uh, we decided to um, just focus on mental health, uh, mental health and food security. And this was a community initiative, uh, but luckily our funders who fund uh, our programs were, were on board and felt that it was very important for us to do also. So a lot of the community um, departments got together and uh, we sent out food boxes for the families. And we pretty well, and, and for a number of reasons, we weren't prepared for the shutdown either. So we were like, you know what? Everybody relax, we'll have a plan when we get back in September to worry about the academics. Um, but right now, you know, this is what's most important, uh, that kind of thing, you know, cause the stress levels were just, you know, everybody knows that part too. Um, so anyway, um, and this was uh, our solution. Uh, to to our community problem. And this went really well. And actually, I even think that uh, the health center and the food center are currently still providing boxes for the elders um, every second week. So that's what we did. We would have, uh, we would provide boxes for the elders on one week. Uh, and then the next week we would provide them for um, specifically for students and uh, families in the community. So we had lots of volunteers you know, at first it was scary because we re we had to clean uh, clean everything. <laughs> but anyway, we got we all got the hang of it. But yeah, we can go on to the next slide. And so our future plans, of course, we want to maintain this. Um, we want we would like again to be more purposeful in our school improvement plans for the year uh, because uh, Leah mentioned a very good point it's true the the year is usually always um, planned out as far as PD so in order for us to provide this balance we're going to have to really explicitly um, plan for um, uh, what we want to foster and so of course like the reason why I showed some of that area is because we're in the process of um, uh, building a new greenhouse and we would like it that there's one door to go in and then another door to go in the back so that we can expand on our greenhouse later for teachers in our little area here where all the the the, the boxes are uh, we want to we want to promote more traditional uh, harvesting uh, with the foods like we had the kids there it was the preschool kids they were there when a local hunter was uh, skinning the moose and all that but we want to go further we want to have the uh, everybody to be part of uh, harvesting and cutting the meat and not just one project. We want this to be just like our school gardens we want this to be part of our school culture this is what we do in the fall. This is what we do in the spring and you know um, so that's kind of like our goal as far as um, uh, promoting more of that and the little, the little kids usually every spring too are part of the local um, uh, releasing of salmon you know and so we just kind of we just don't like I said we just don't want it to ha happen once and um, Somi uh, provided some uh, PD for us and I tell you, our staff was just, they loved it. And I think Roland's in your uh, little group here too. And he was there and oh my gosh, they really loved it. And we said at the time, we should do this all the time. And, uh, and then the pandemic too happened. So it's true. And that's what we're trying to do. That's why I showed the gazebo there because all there's a lot of space there that we want to um, really purposely provide for um, some outdoor classrooms so that more than one classroom can be out there at one time. And uh, yeah, so we're all done. And this is just, I just want to share one picture of our space. And uh, we had a local artist come in and um, uh, really kind of, we wanted to show all of our traditional foods in the area that we sit in. So there's lots more uh, painting there, but you can't, you can't really see it from that view. But anyway, this just want you to see it all. And uh, thank you to our sponsors and thank you, Somi and everybody else and Lalioq. Awesome, thank you so much. Oh, it is so cool to see these pictures. Um, and if any of the presenters are panicking, no, uh, only only Terry Ann was bringing <laughs> pictures. So it's okay that you didn't bring any. <laughs> um, I see that my chat box was exploding a little bit. Um, wow, Terry Ann, thank you so much for sharing these. And I'm so excited to hear um, your contributions on the panel today as well. Um, and speaking of the panel, uh, it looks like uh, Donna actually just joined us. Yes. Um, 
Donna, are you with us? Yes. Hi, everybody. Oh, hi. Oh, it's hi. so great. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, yes, my goodness. Being a little bit late. That and is okay. I know how busy your schedule is. And on my wing. Oh, we, you, you just cut out for us. Something against the window. Still there? Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I said behind me on the window, I had to, it was too bright. So I had to uh, put something. I, I don't like to block out the sun, but I had to do something. So but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. It's so great to see you. I just missed the last person. Who was that? Terry Ann Larry, uh, principal of Natwaka Egg School. Oh. I'll put her Madeline. spotlight back on. Madeline. She's just unmuting. Willie. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, I missed your presentation, but, you know, it's okay. At least I know you're here. Yeah. Well, we can talk more, I guess. <laughs> okay, then. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, oh my goodness, Donna, thank you so much for joining. I hope you're not feeling rushed. I just want to double check because you just uh, joined us that the interpretation button is working for you. Um, I don't, I don't know if you speak French or not. Um, no, I was going to okay. say, I was looking yesterday, I was looking real hard for the translation Mi'kmaq button. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll need to start hiring you to do that for us. Um, <laughs> so if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's going to yes. be a button there that says interpretation. And this yes, will be helpful to anybody that. who's joined us late as well. Okay. So make sure that you click on the language that you want to be hearing, if that's English or if okay. that's French. Um, and that way, we'll just make sure nobody gets behind. Okay. Um, so the first thing I would like to do, um, Donna, um, would it be okay if I um, present tobacco in... Um, what would you like me to present it to Donna or to your spirit name? Oh, to Donna, and then I, I explain. I and then I introduce myself with my spirit. Okay, name. perfect. Um, so I will do that now. So we have talked about this a little bit yesterday, but for anybody who wasn't there, this is the Zoom, um, the Zoom appropriate way for us to get around safety and making sure that elders are being well taken care of. So I'm presenting this tobacco to Donna today. Um, for being on the panel and for also performing a closing ceremony for us today. Um, okay. okay, so symbolically I will accept. And uh, I'm not quite sure what it has to do with safety, but... <laughs> well, COVID safety, I wouldn't want to get oh, you sick. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I was like, okay. I was thinking, is she talking about spiritual safety? <laughs> well, I guess COVID safety is that. And I, I would just like to introduce myself with my spirit name. Uh, so I just told you uh, my spirit name is Thunderbird, uh, uh, Thunderbird Turtle Woman, and I am from the northeast coast of what we call Turtle Island. North America, we refer to that as, uh, as Turtle Island. So I'm very um, happy to be here today with all of you. I don't know if I was supposed to share. I don't know what's happening. So just bring me on board, <laughs> include me wherever. Fantastic. You're on board. That's great. Yes, but I know that I know that I'm doing the closing. So I'm very, because yesterday I uh, I did the opening, right? So, so I'm, I'm very happy to do the closing today. I'm honored. Thank you. We're also honored. Well, Aline. Oh. Um, so the other panelists that I would love to introduce are um, Jessica Hughes from Sackville 2020 and a whole bunch of other organizations. Most of these people wear at least three hats. Um, Hannah Ayler, who wears so many hats that I can't keep track. Um, <laughs> Terry Ann Larry is going to be a, a panelist as well. We've just met her. Um, Jimmy Terrain from uh, Gaia Project. And Donna is here. Great. So I will excuse myself because our moderator, Leah, we are in very good hands. Just wait for the rest of our panelists to meet okay. the spotlight. Welcome all. We've got some excellent questions lined up for today. Um, so I'm very excited to move through those. Why don't we start with Jimmy introducing himself? Yeah, we'll start. Uh, you can go ahead, Jimmy, if you'd like. Sure. No, merci. Uh, I'll 
talk in French for this session. Je vais parler en français. I'm going to speak in French for this session. Uh, my name is uh, Jimmy Therrien. I'm a uh, director of uh, programming for the Gaia Project. It's an organization, a nonprofit organization based in Fredericton, New Brunswick. And we are active on throughout the territory, New Brunswick territory. Even we are even starting to see people interested from outside as well. So it's exciting. I have, uh, I have, uh, I'm with Gaia for almost 10 years, it will be 10 years this year. I wore several hats over the years, uh, uh, project uh, uh, agent, uh, general manager, and now a uh, director of programming. And our mission is to encourage uh, climate action among young people uh, through, uh, through education, so through the education system in New Brunswick. So I'm very, very happy to be here uh, this morning to discuss with other uh, panelists uh, in this uh, particular panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy. No, no, Thierry Ann. We've had a brief introduction to you, if you just want to give a couple sentences just to rekindle our flame. Um, okay, am I unmuted here? Okay. Um, you mean similar to what I said at the beginning or just? Yeah, just a couple yeah. of words, uh, just where you're from and okay so Nadawagan Egg, um, community member here um, again a principal for three years and teacher since 2002 um, I am um, I work closely with our Nadawagan Egg language committee and uh, trying to revitalize language in our community um, I do have lots of things on the go my husband has a meat shop <laughs> he just opened up a local uh, meat shop here in the community uh, so I help him too um, and actually that's an initiative that came that started from the pandemic also because of our food boxes because he had a he had a, a meat shop at our home and then kind of grew anyway I'm going on again so <laughs> When you ask me questions about me, I can really, really fill the space here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> if you didn't have anything to say, we might have more questions. <laughs> uh, Hannah. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a third year student at Mount Allison University. I study international community planning, um, environmental studies, and French. I, um, I, I do wear multiple hats, <laughs> but part of my learning right now at Mount Allison um, is looking at youth empowerment in community planning. Um, and I will probably say later on during the panel, but um, school is community and community is school. And so through what I have learned um, with my degree, I have become very involved in discussions about sustainable education um, and what our systems look like now and um, what they may look like moving forward um, through a planning perspective, but I have many connections to different educators in um, the Sackville area. And so I've become very involved <laughs> in different aspects of my degree. Um, I am also part of the THMR COVID-19 task force. I'm the co-chair of the Youth and Student Action Group. Um, involved in the Rotary Club as part of the Rotary Foundation um, at Mount Allison University and um, research studies in, in various capacities about the sustainable development goals um, in relation to education and in planning. Um, I think that's about it, thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. And Donna, if you wouldn't mind giving us a brief introduction. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I mentioned uh, earlier my spirit name and um, I'm Nigma. I'm from El I, uh, um, I'm really involved with uh, culture, culture and culture awareness. Um, I don't know if people are aware, but uh, when I was growing up, there was no evidence of our culture here in the East because of colonization and, and uh, we experienced assimilation first. And so, um, but I was determined, um, after I went to my first ceremony, <clears throat> I was determined to help bring this back to our people. And that's what I've been doing. So I, I've traveled all over. I'm part of many different things. I, um, I'm on the Indigenous Advisory Council to Human Rights Meetings in Winnipeg. So I, I'm on a uh, national elders councils across the, um, you know, across Canada. On American side, I work under a law, NAGPRA law, Native American Grapes Protection Repatriation Act law. Um, 
I'm on international repatriation. So I do, and I, and I travel a lot. I used to, except for COVID, um, uh, learning and uh, from different cultures and different spiritual leaders. Um, and so I feel that um, it's time now that I educate on some of what I have learned. And, uh, but I will tell you that with this COVID, it's something that, uh, you know, I'll be 69 years old, have seven uh, grown up children and 23 grandchildren. I'm considered a spiritual elder in my community. And, but this COVID is something that I never experienced ever before. Like it's something so totally new and uh, it took us by surprise. But one thing I know that our people are very adaptable and, we, and we're adapting. We're adapting to uh, you know, what we need to do. And I know that we all have to be uh, uh, careful. And so uh, I'm just very happy to be a part of this conversation and to learn that so many people are really um, working towards respecting the environment, being part of the environment, because as indigenous people, we believe that we are part of the land and the land is part of us. And when part of that land is taken away, uh, we lose our language, we lose our culture and identity. So it's, we're so interrelated with this land. So I just thought I would add that. Thank you. And I'm... Beautiful addition. Thank you very much, Donna. And last but certainly not least, Jessica Hughes. Hey folks, uh, I, you'll probably see that I have a background, but you can see a seatbelt because I am in a car right now. Um, <laughs> I really didn't want to miss it, but we had so many things on the go today. We're actually just uh, swinging into Dorchester School right now to drop off some um, supplies for some cool programming they got coming up. So we're a little all over the place. But uh, so I'm Jess Hughes. I'm the executive director of Sackville 2020. Um, and community supported education is what we are involved with. That's the name of our game. And we are tantrum our wide. And I see Hannah on this call, which I'm really excited about. But we do a lot of work as well with the COVID task force, the tantrum our COVID task force. Um, and a lot of work with our Youth and Student Action Committees to really mobilize youth around collective action in our community. Um, and we work with the schools, with uh, provincial organizations, we work at the government level. It's kind of the joy of being a nonprofit working in education reform. Um, we belong to the people and we represent the voices of our youth and of our kids and of our families. And so uh, there's been lots of interesting things happening with COVID. We know that there have been some unique challenges presented, but as many of you have mentioned, we've really um, sought out the opportunity to innovate. Now is the time to try things differently. Now is the time to push the boundaries, to push back against status quo, to um, take risks because uh, if we don't, we have so much more to lose. And so that's what's been exciting about hearing about a lot of the great um, success coming out of COVID. I know we can sometimes be deficit focused, but I really have seen some amazing, amazing community supported initiatives where community and schools are really coming together to, um, to support our, to support our families and our children. So um, glad to be part of the conversation today. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and so with that, I'll move right into our first question. Uh, and just so all the panelists are aware, I will ask a question and you simply answer it. There's no format here. Just raise your hand if you feel inspired to do so. Uh, question number one. When you consider how resources are distributed in our communities versus how they are distributed around the world, can you identify any solutions that may go into redesigning a system that places less strain on vital school services and resources when local resources are scarce or unavailable completely? Wow, that's a long question. <laughs> um, I could speak to a little bit around what we saw with food and food security. I mean, that was one of the first impacts we felt from the pandemic was uh, we suddenly realized how much um, our kids access and rely on food programming and food services. And so similar to what Terry Ann School did, the tantrum are really rallied around um, partnering with community organizations. Uh, Lindsay and her crew locally uh, around the school food response group really stepped up and said, okay, we know we can't go into the schools and that a lot of kids are missing these um, lunch programs. And <coughs> we do as a community. And so uh, groups were really quickly mobilized to get food out to these communities. 250 boxes of food went out a week in our area alone. Um, and then that led us to another issue, which was around access to food. And because there were all these blockages within the system about 
and food prices going up and things being so expensive that we really, it forced us to think more locally, um, which many of us have tried to do uh, over the years, but it's been difficult, you know, when we haven't had a situation forcing us to think that way. Um, and so really leaning into um, partnerships with farmers and uh, food security advocates and uh, associations to figure out how do we, you know, supply and demand. The supply, the demand went up everywhere, not just for schools. I mean, communities, everyone was trying to get access to food, um, food that was more locally sourced and more affordable. So that was an area that we saw both as a, as a, as a challenge um, and as an opportunity. Did anybody else want to elaborate on that? And Jimmy, I'll leave some up. Go ahead, Jimmy. Uh, on the first side at the Gaia project, it's certain that it created uh, uh, a new type of problem with the arrival of COVID because we're active in the classrooms. So we're, we're usually in person, present in person to support educational programs and bring young lead uh, youth in developing the project. But there it was no longer possible we no longer had access. So how do we know how do we still provide those resources? So, so we had a lot of discussions around that. We had to look at different scenarios. And finally, we said to ourselves, look, we're going to go, we're going to start something completely new. We had regular program and because it was no longer possible and time did not allow us to, uh, to adapt it right away. We said, look, we're going to keep this for later on and we're going to start a new, completely new project. That is where the, the climate mission uh, it came to, to be. It's a it's a, a type of it's resources around certain themes. We've developed a theme days every week. We'd send, uh, we'd encourage parents to, to, uh, to subscribe because we knew the, the children were at home now for a certain period of time. So we knew that we had to offer a quality education uh, on on uh, environment and uh, climate action, but to do it in a more indirect way, virtual, digital way. So we developed the content. I would say that Gaia for us, it allowed us to, to open doors that we never dared open before. For example, uh, doing videos uh, at home, we never explored that before. And it gave us a, a chance to dive into that and to explore those types of platforms and to furnish videos, uh, content, uh, pedagogical content, to workshops, uh, things virtually. And it really, really uh, was uh, so good. And now that resource is is permanent on our website. And it's uh, allowed us to really revisit the way we offered our uh, programming. Because before we would do it in person only now, and now we had to find a way to do something that was uh, uh, uploadable. So. It's good because I think in the future we'll be able to afford uh, uh, more <laughs> of that type of support. And we have a lot of uh, positive comments from the teachers as well that found that those resources were uh, very, very good for, for teachers. It gives them content that they can adapt it to their needs. Uh, we, we have our copyright on it, obviously, but the teachers can adapt it to, to their needs. So that's very good. There's nothing... Uh, written in stone, though it's not a cookie cutter approach. We give them a certain direction and then they do what they want with it. And so to answer the question of, of access, for us, <laughs> it was it was in part virtually, of course, we had to find content that was able to be done over a, a digital platform. But now with our new program, <laughs> we we had to reinvent ourselves and we and we uh, and we went that route and it's very uh, quite a challenge. Uh, it requires certain logistics. You have to be sure that uh, that, that that you have a certain that you only have a limited amount of resources as well. So, but I think it it changed for always how we do things, and I think a lot of organizations will be able to benefit from these types of approaches in the future. Thank you. Does anybody have any comments? Uh, if not, we will go ahead. No, um, I, I echo everything that Jess and, and Jimmy have already said from my own perspective as a student. Um, and I think that, I mean, now more than ever, we have realized that local knowledge is, is so important and so key. Um, being able to recognize what 
the needs of students and youth are in our own communities um, is, is, is vital. Um, and, and that happens through breaking down silos, through communicating with community groups and organizations that are looking to support youth. And so just redesigning a system that breaks down those barriers and, and allows an open flow of discussion between schools and the greater community, I think is so important. And um, it was amazing to see through my work um, on the task force in the Tanshamar community. And simply, it wasn't simply Sackville that was involved in the discussion, but it was the entire Tanshamar region, including Dorchester and Port Elegan. And as a student that had been primarily based in Sackville, I had no idea what was going on in these other communities. But the task force, because of COVID, brought everyone together and made me interested and really passionate about supporting the youth and students in these other areas as well. And it was, it was, it was a, um, the, the feeling was mutual. There was also just this mutual, beautiful support between community and schools across the entire region, which showed a, a great strength um, when it comes to regionalizing different services while still keeping it local and, and really focusing on, on the needs of your youth specifically or your students specifically. Um, so using local knowledge to our advantage um, really, well, became really, really clear to myself throughout this entire experience of COVID-19 um, and making sure that we break down these silos that might have previous, well, definitely previously existed before this entire experience, um, I think is one of the key things to, to move forward with. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Hannah. I will move right along to, to our next question, uh, which I think ties well into this discussion. Um, so the solutions, adaptations, and resources schools and communities are implementing demonstrate the interconnectedness of many levels of our society, meaning schools, communities, agriculture. Uh, what other sectors of society can you see coming together in these solutions if they've not already? I'll put the question up in the chat. Um, Jessica speaking. Uh, I mean, I think it's been pretty apparent that uh, the pandemic has been um, harder for some than others, but that it does take the whole village to come together to really affect change in any kind of way. Um, and over the years, as a community developer, I've spent lots of time trying to engage um, what some people would deem more difficult sectors to work with. And this seemed to have removed some of those, those barriers and those silos because we were all coming together for the same reason. Um, and it was to uh, survive and get through it and help one another. And so, I mean, similar to what Hannah was saying, I guess already, I think that there is still, there's so much devastation that has come out of this pandemic. Um, environmental and and in the world of education but there's also just so much good because it has reminded us of our humanity in a lot of ways and it has shined a light on the cracks of the system in a way that i don't think many of us can look away from again um and so i'm hoping that that at a, at a human level at an individual level uh, we can all remember that and continue um to, to to build bridges between sectors because we now see how much how, how quickly we can mobilize, right? And how quickly we can actionize when we actually put our titles to the side, put the sectors we work for to the side and just come together as a united front for humanity. And I think that, that we've really seen that across the province in many ways and it's just truly inspiring. So that's, that's my hope coming out of it. Right, and terri did you have something you wanted to say? You, you look like you did. Just get you to unmute there. I I feel like these questions that you're posing are, this is like our continuous um, struggle is trying to find ways like, you know, even for First Nations, you know, we're not, uh, we don't necessarily have provincial uh, jurisdiction and you know what I mean? And, you know, and then we are independent in ways and then, and then, then there's the federal government, like anyway, like when talking about your previous um, question and even now, like 
I feel like I would love to have some solutions on how to uh, come together and to um, uh, work together more because we do always have a barrier. There's always a barrier of funding, jurisdiction, that kind of thing that always comes into play. But I think maybe like if I go back to how our community um, handled this, um, it was having the same vision. You know what I mean? So if, it, it's, if we can kind of come together with the same vision, you know, somewhat with what you're doing here, I think maybe then some things may come easier if we're all, you know, cause I, I don't know if the challenges of funding is because of different visions. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? You know, so because in crisis, like what, what are we gonna focus on? And um, so if we can do a little bit of um, future planning, uh, maybe that will help, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's a really great point. And I think that that vision um, is maybe touched on in this final question. So this will be the final question for the panel. Um, and we encourage everyone to respond, um, seeing as it will be the last. Um, so no matter the age, race, sexual orientation, health, or socioeconomic background of a student, educational institutions intend to offer across the board services accessible to all students. But when schools shut down, barriers come into light, offering inequitable access and quality of education to many students incapable of controlling these external circumstances. What can we take away from this experience at large to create a stronger support system for those who need it the most? And I've put that up in the chat as well for all of our participants, if you are liking to reread the question. I'll um, maybe uh, touch on that. Um, I've, well, again, going back to what I discussed before, like we do, I think we have to intentionally touch on all these issues all the time not just uh, when the crisis happens, you know what I mean? And then going back to vision, how, how, what do we want to invest in? And, and the reason why uh, like I wanted to talk about that because I, we, came, we uh, did come across all these barriers for the kids, the special needs and kids who are um, um, struggling with their sexual identity. And how do we create the safe spaces in the schools also, right? And that's what we found. We can't just focus on the one day. Like we have to try to uh, educate ourselves to be more open to all of the needs in the school. Um, but then again, that it always goes back to planning. <laughs> you know, how are we going to make sure that we do uh, touch on all these things throughout the year? Because if you do too much you end up not doing, accomplishing anything. And I feel that way about our outdoor education. You know, I've been in contact with um, so many, a few times and, you know, with and trying to uh, really get into depth uh, with some of the things uh, that your organization offers. But then it's like, it comes to this time of the year and we're not planned. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's what we're trying to get ahead of it to try to create more spaces that we can use so that when we do have an opportunity, um, we can start implementing our outdoor education more. And you know what I mean? Like, I'm just using that as an example, but I think, you know, if we can kind of do that. And I think this is all, everything's sort of repeating. And I think, I don't know if that was intentional, Leah, <laughs> to bring us to that awareness of uh, to really try to uh, work together uh, to, to plan more for the future. Thank you, Terry Ann. And on that note, I mean, yes, the conference, what pandemics teach us about teaching, um, all of these responses are the answer to that question. So um, I'm glad that, that that was the intent and that is playing out. Does, does anyone else want to speak to this question or comment on what Terry Ann just said? Um, I'll make a quick comment, and Jess again. Um, 
one of the, f- the few things that we immediately saw in our rural community, like in the Tantramar, um, comparative to what I was hearing, uh, different kinds of struggles from my peers and colleagues and families in bigger cities, you know, internet connectivity, access to technology in the house. I think sometimes the world just assumed it would be easy for everybody to go online, not understanding that many of our families have one computer per household and maybe three or four kids and and how that would even work. And then what an assumption it is to assume that they have parents that can facilitate that type of learning and that they have the living spaces to do that kind of learning. So that was a huge barrier um, for us. And then none the rather, you know, the internet connectivity part, which is pretty uh, so-so in in the rural uh, parts of New Brunswick, which were 80% rural. So 80% of us, I'm sure, struggled with this. Um, and then the food security uh, side of things and, and all of it. So that, yeah, the, the barrier, the equity piece around around internet access and, and connectivity was a big one. Awesome. We found too, a lot of families had just phones. You know what I mean? Going back to your uh, uh, connectivity problem, you know, how do you teach or how do you deliver a, a teaching or any kind of curriculum from a phone? <laughs> so I just wanted to add to that. <laughs> right. Technology isn't uh, necessarily um, a, a right. Um, so it brings into question a lot of what goes into having access to technology. And that shouldn't be um, a barrier or a filter between good education and not. Uh, Jimmy, final comments? Uh, First side, I would say the technology, it's, we went around that. We found a way as we asked who has access to technology who, and who has access to the students. The teacher has all the tools. Uh, when the teachers engage, that they have their, uh, their computer, they have access to the internet. And we're aware that for a moment, uh, teachers were outside and at home. So we had to uh, go through the teacher to send our content to the students. But once the teacher returned to class, the students, there is that bridge we have to to build with the, the teacher. And we realize in these difficult times, we often say that we, we empower, I don't have any other word to say it in French, but we empower students in this way to move climate action. But in a situation like we were facing right now, we have to do it uh, through the teacher. So. Essentially, we're empowering the students, but we're empowering teachers first and foremost to be able to deliver that content to them. So that was uh, coming out of our comfort zone a little bit uh, because we're used to taking the lead, to, to taking the, the place of the teacher and the support the teacher. But now the teacher became the person who delivered our programming. So we have to furnish them the tools uh, with the, all the, the, the right the direction. And the teacher became the the person who delivered the content. And we realized that through these approaches that maybe it's beneficial because the teacher is going to appropriate herself or herself with the content instead of certain teachers who, you know, we're not going to hide it. They're going to look at these uh, these times that we're there to some free time to, to do some other things uh, and do things they don't have uh, time to do. Uh, and, uh, and this uh, gives them this, this, it gives them this further knowledge. And we know that uh, that the climate change, there's a, a lack of confidence from teachers sometimes to deliver that type of uh, complex content. So by giving them tools, by giving them a good support and being there with them virtually to, to support them, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a professional development uh, for the teacher as well. And it allows them to raise the level of uh, confidence to deliver that type of content. So that is the approach that we, we've taken. But I think first and foremost, we have to listen to the young people. We've seen that this year, young people were greatly affected. Mental health was a, a major thing, not just for young people, for adults as well. You know, uh, people have lost their jobs and things like that. But for young people, it really uh, shook them uh, to the core. We've never imagined uh, being in this type of situation and what 
And with what they needed, I don't think we were ready to address that question at the start. And I think in the future, it would be important to include them at all levels and to listen to what they need. In particular, the, the marginalized youth, uh, you know, from, uh, sexual orientations and things like that, listen to them and offer them the right resources. And not things that are complex, but things that speak to them, that allows them to develop their own knowledge and, at all levels, their knowledge and, and how to do things as well, how to, to be, so how to be a member of society if you feel differently, how to take your proper place and to expose your difference, differences and not be scared to do it. I think there's a lot of things that we need to improve in the future with a lot of work to do, but, but I see this particular time also as, as a, I think it, it allowed us to uh, reflect a lot on the past year. Jimmy, for Thank you very much, Jimmy, for that. Adil? Hi, I would like to add something, okay? Uh, okay, go ahead, Donna. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll move right to you next. Yeah, it's kind of like the different questions all together, but this is one thing that I see um, that is happening. Um, with, with, the, uh, with the COVID, um, they missed one another. The young people really missed one another at school and now they're back. And, um, but one thing that they're really learning is um, truly how to look at a crisis and how to work together, how to come together. And in our way, you know, when we do the, uh, the circle is very important. And when I go into a classroom, if I do a sharing circle, I remind each and every student in that classroom that, that every single person in that, within that circle has value, that each and, each and every person has worth. And so they need to feel that sense of, uh, sense of, of worth. And, uh, and I think this pandemic made them feel helpless too, as well. Made them feel as if they couldn't do anything. So doing something, not just writing, you know, not just writing um, things, uh, as in a classroom setting, but actually physically doing something, um, providing their input, uh, I feel it's, it's very beneficial because, it, again, in our culture, we're told to balance the four parts of ourselves, which are the physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional. Those four quadrants on the medicine wheel that um, if we leave one part out, we're going to get off balance. So, so in this sense that it's... Um, the ones that are being uh, marginalized or they they feel they can they're they're included in something they're included in coming together almost like consensus to to uh to achieve an outcome at least some ideas of how they can make things happen so i just really feel that um it's there's a lot of a lot of students that are still um they're they're really having a hard time with this they're feeling uh like i said they like was just mentioned by the last speaker that They've never experienced anything like this. And so doing something together makes them feel that they have something to contribute and that they truly are valuable and that their thoughts, their suggestions are valuable along with the teachers, just as valid as the teachers. So thank you, Alani. Excellent, thank you so much, Donna. And Hannah, uh, you had something to say, I believe. Yeah, I did. Thank you so much for those comments, Donna. Um, I was about to touch on them from my own perspective, actually. Um, and merci beaucoup aussi, Jimmy. Je suis totalement d'accord avec tout ce que vous avez dit. And thank you very much, Jimmy, for all that you contributed as well. That a little bit as well. Um, but as far as what we can take away from this experience, first of all, um, I think one of the biggest things that we should take away is questioning our own definitions of education. How, how do we view education and, and what does education look like in our respective communities? Um, does education really have to remain between four classroom walls or can it be viewed from a completely different lens? And I think once we open up that sort of discussion and dialogue, then there are so many more opportunities to be inclusive of these marginalized communities or of these youth that may be falling behind because the reality is the system was not made for each and every student and each and every youth. There are people that are being left behind. And I think that COVID-19 has really um, been a catalyst for this discussion of, of where are these gaps? Like, and where are we falling short? And 
um, that means that the system has to change in my, in my opinion. Um, through my degree, I have learned so much about the value of experiential learning. And I'll use that as an example um, because it seems that in, in most things that I do, I'm having this holistic experience of education. Um, a lot of my learning, I have studied abroad. I have been involved in business development. I have learned about education simply through discussions with educators. And through these different experiences, I have learned just as much, if not more, than I have sitting in a classroom and taking notes in front of a teacher or in front of a professor. And these experiences have to be valued just as much as, as the traditional academic experience. And so being open to viewing education in these sort of different ways, I think is definitely something that we can take away from COVID-19 and move forward in order to offer new opportunities for those that aren't currently succeeding with the current system that we have in place. Um, and that really ties into Donna's comments as well, because from the youth empowerment perspective, um, there's so much that the community can do to support youth through experiential learning, um, but through other means as well, because youth that have a sense of place and a sense of belonging in their community are going to be inspired and motivated to give back to their community as well. And so not only is it an opportunity for education for the youth and the students, but it also builds a stronger community in general and as a whole. And so there's, I, I just, it seems so clear to me to break those silos and use these different experiences and opportunities to engage youth in your community as also dually an experience or an opportunity for education. Um, I, I've been privileged to work with the Cooperative Social Enterprise Council of New Brunswick as well. And, and through there, I've learned about cooperatives and social enterprises and governance structures. And that's just one example of how you can look for these opportunities for education for, for other youth. And so um, giving youth a sense of place and belonging and feeling that they're safe in their own community is just, just seems like a very clear path moving forward from, from my own perspective. Yeah, I mean, what do pandemics teach us about teaching? Maybe that teaching is something completely different altogether. So uh, yeah, excellent, uh, excellent uh, perspective, excellent ideas. Um, audience, participants, we've heard a lot of interesting uh, discussion just now in the last few minutes. So does anyone have any questions? Um, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat or raise your hand, uh, unmute yourself. Um, I wonder you if, um, directly or... do you mind if I break in with a little bit of mini improv here? Um, while the audience is thinking, um, lorsque les participants uh, réfléchissent uh, while the the is thinking about the question, uh, I would like to, to invite you to stand up, everyone, if it's possible. I'm watching all of you. So let's bring some great minds think outside into this because it's been more than an hour already. Um, je vous invite de juste uh, se bouger well, un petit peu. I invite you to move a little bit. Et, um, la première chose the à first faire, thing to do. Um, the first thing that we do. Oh, thank you so much, Jess uh, Hughes, for joining us. I see this. The cell phone is dropping. Thank you so much for joining. Um, okay. So the first thing to do in um, a Great Minds Think Outside session, and also, may I say, even any session when you take your kids outside, is to create a circle with your students of Velcro elbows. So you do this and make it look like everybody is joining on the screen together. Um, so imagine that there's Velcro on, the, on your elbows and you stick them together. And now everybody, please try to unmute for a second and we're gonna unstick them as soon as we've made our nice circle. So imagine you're up with your students, you've got your elbows, they're stuck together. Um, and on three, we're going to rip apart and make the sound of Velcro. So one, two, three, perfect. So this is a fantastic way to make a barrier um, in a schoolyard. They're, um, 
a lot of the time when kids come outside, they're like, oh, great, it's recess. And then you can't really get them to focus on the curriculum. So having them up in a circle with Velcro elbows is a great way to communicate to them that now it's time to not only play, but to do some learning. Um, everybody do a little dance, stretch out a little bit. And now I hope that we've had some time to think about some questions. Please put them in the chat. I think it's, um, I think we all have to go back to the table and just look at what we're actually teaching. <laughs> you know, I know there is a movement in, in, uh, at the department, like, cause I am involved in some of those uh, meetings and stuff, uh, you know, to go towards more of a global, um, more of a global curriculum, right? So that you do have that autonomy to really, um, uh, well, for us, it would be autonomy for us to to uh, include culture, but then, you know, you're still part of the, of the overall um, uh, movement for climate change and, you know, uh, outdoor um, activities and all that kind of thing. I'm still in the process, I have it up here from our great minds, uh, activity uh Roland uh was it Roland that yeah he identified uh a number of bird species in our um in our outdoor area so that's been a project that I still didn't follow through with and it was just I wanted to get some um those uh, birds that he identified I wanted to put them um post them you know what I mean? And signs like the weather kind of proof uh, signs so that if anyone visits our area that they would, you know, know that these are the species. Anyway, I went off on a tangent, but um, I guess I information, Terry, honestly. So I just, I know though, um, Anna Lee has a question burning. Hmm. I'll see. I thought I'd, I'd say it instead of trying to to, 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 to write in, in the chat box. Um, I first wanted to say thank you, merci, Wallalin, for the panelists. Uh, very interesting to hear all of you speak. Um, my, my question is mainly about youth. So have we even asked what, what they would like to see uh, like in education now? any ideas or projects, et cetera, that they would like to do in their communities, in their schools, uh, what would they be interested in doing? Uh, do we have uh, that uh, that dialogue with them? That I'm asking myself the question because just like that, I just want to know if, uh, if it's something that was done, if it's an approach maybe that was thought of, or uh, it really, we're talking about uh, youth engagement here, and when it comes to uh, programs, uh, community development, et cetera. So I'm just, asking you questions. I was just waiting for someone else, but <laughs> did someone else say they were going to it? Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. That's all I was going to just comment on. It's true, like, you know, because I really think that we shouldn't use curriculum as a barrier because I know for a fact there are many ways to include these ideas and then still cover curriculum. That was just my point. But you're right to. this experience at Mount Allison University specifically, but I do know that um, my degree in international community planning is a specially approved major at Mount Allison University, meaning that um, I see Dr. Michael Fox is on the call, but he really supported me in, in designing my own degree and tailoring it to what I wanna study moving forward. And so 
I am the only person at Mount Allison that currently studies what I'm studying. But there's not very many other students that take advantage of this opportunity. And it's the same with experiential learning. Um, there is about 2200 students at Mount Allison University and only a handful around 30 or so and I'm sure Dr. Fox could correct me if that's not accurate that are taking advantage of experiential learning opportunities. And the momentum is growing. There's a lot of talk in the University Senate and among students now about the advantage of experiential learning and really being, being in charge of our own education and, and um, seeking out the experiences that we want to have and learning the things we want to learn. But it really is just, it's just at the beginning. Um, so from what I know, there is, is not a whole lot of conversation to the youth and to the students, again, post-secondary students, um, about what where we would like to see education going. But I do have a lot of hope moving forward. And in my position at the Student Union um, next year, I will be strongly advocating for students to think about this and reflect on this and, and hopefully shed some more light on experiential learning and independent study specifically. But the whole the ideas behind education as a whole. Um, I hope to advocate for that on, on my behalf, but of course I also cannot be the only one. Um, and so I do think that as this discussion grows, it's um, momentum is gained. They're really, yeah, we have to have discussions like these moving forward and and create general awareness that, that yes, we are students and we are, are paying for our tuition and so we should have a say in what it is we're learning and how we want to learn it. Um, there is that side of it as well. Just, just to add uh, to that question, rapidly. Just to add to that quickly, I think we, we, add, we ask it to the, the opinions of youth in certain circumstances, but I think it always, it always comes with, with a certain uh, a framework like uh, I'm just thinking of our programs that when we're looking at uh, the statistics, we're an organization that works uh, on climate change, but, but we, we understand that when we look at uh, sustainable development initiatives, the, the you can you can connect uh, these subjects subject to all other uh, objectives. So the question is not are we just in sciences or not. We have to find those connections with other subject matters as well. So maybe in speaking to you, we we value the development of, uh, of skills and everything like that. But I don't think we do. I don't think we do well if we don't we don't ask a project, ask the children to do a project other than through sciences or like a, maybe okay. one project could encompass a lot of different uh, subjects and that is where we will uh, we will will do well by them if we give them that voice and find that together without uh, giving them set objectives. I think uh, say, Laura, I'm not on the panel but I didn't say something. To say that uh, for me from my point of view at Hampton High School is that it when teachers feel that it's important, they will find a way to, to incorporate it in their classes. I really think it starts with um, teachers understanding climate change and understanding the urgency of it and understanding the importance of it. And when they do and they, they learn about it, they, they you, you have to teach it. You, you can't not teach it when you learn it. Like, if you really understand climate change, there is no way that you cannot incorporate it every possible chance you have, no matter what course you're teaching. And um, I think that that's so, so important. And, and um, I just want to add one thing that at our school, we did do a survey. We were really concerned with mental health. And so we did do a survey um, near the end of the first semester to see if students, like what they learn from first semester that can help them second semester or what they can learn from other students. And one of the students' one questions was, um, what are some activities you really enjoyed doing this semester? And without doubt, all of them said things that involved their friends, involved working outside in the greenhouse, working with their hands. All these are the things that they said they enjoyed. And um, after that, our school, I mentioned this yesterday, they used $1,500 of our school improvement planning money to buy lumber to build uh, raised beds in the garden. 
And when the school saw from the student's point of view how important it was, then they were putting the resources into it. So it either, it either has to come from the teachers or from the students, but if it comes from both ends, you're, you're golden. So I just- Thank you so much, Laura. That's so that. helpful. Um, I just really want to take this momentum and move it into the breakout rooms because we've got to get this discussion rolling and I want everybody to have a chance to speak. So if you remember back way back at the beginning of this, um, we talked about the different um, uh, C teams, Sustainability Education Alliance teams. You can see them all there. If you click on breakout rooms, please go ahead and join the rooms. Um, and we will be sending uh, we have a series of questions and we will be um, encouraging you to join the Jamboard. So we're going to put the link in the chat here. Um, and please do just join those uh, rooms. So Art and Sustainability Education, Team PD, Sustainable Business edu Education, Educo de Development Durable, Peace and Friendship Alliance Book Club, um, School Gardens Jardin Scolar. So please go ahead and join those. Or if there's another team that you'd like to see, then do that. So we have a choice to join the one we were in yesterday or a new one. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And so me, I just wanted to mention that um, for the Jamboard, it's saying that I need access. Ooh, let me fix that. Thank you. Woohoo! Please, panelists, be free. <laughs> Thank you so much, also. Thanks to you. Thanks for the invite. I don't know which one to choose. It's hard. You can technically <laughs> yeah, I, go in and out to others. Yeah, and I, I, I don't have a lot of time to spend, so I want to use the, the right one, because I'll have to step out. OK. Um, Um, well, we talked, I can do it. I took some notes. I don't know where these notes went. I think they, they, uh, they ended up perhaps somewhere else, but um, we uh, talked about the importance of uh, educate, uh, learning coming from the person who is doing the learning. So a, a child who is able to delve into something, uh, learn about something through, uh, by interest. So uh, learning about uh, butterflies because it's something you're interested in. And we also talked about the importance of, of outdoor learning and how the basis for all knowledge uh, can stem from environmental learning, ecological learning. Um, Nadine, give it, or maybe Nadine, if you want to give your example uh, in terms of how, the, how that could be at the basis of, of learning. Um. No, well, that's okay. I mean, again, to me, it's like you can't, you need to know the natural world outside your door, you know, and, and the creatures and plants that live there, if you want to have any, you know, that's the foundation for understanding climate change or anything else. But also, once you're outside, you're, you're doing that holistic education, right? Like, it's not just your, your thoughts, it's your whole body, it's movement, it's physical activity, it's all five senses and all that good stuff. Awesome. School gardens? Jardin Scolar? Qui était, uh, qui était who, was, uh, uh, who was the reporter in the, the school gardens? I don't think we chose a reporter necessarily. <laughs> we were just talking about things. But are you good? Do you want to put the jam board up to share or I think or just want us to talk about what was on there, what, what we put on there? Oh. Whoa. So it took us like I, I we wanted to have more time because in question number one, we need to hear why everybody was in this meeting. We didn't have a lot of time to get into that too much. But on um, the first question about um, does teach, does do schools give you give? Do, <laughs> I'm trying to read what it says. Is education provide information, provide knowledge, or both? So basically, we thought you need teachers do need to have the information, um, but they need to know where to get. We want to know where to get the information from in a way that we know that it's reliable information and accurate information. So we, I think we think both. The answer is both. <laughs> but we also think that there's more than that. There's skills like problem solving skills and critical thinking skills and research skills. Um, and uh, trying to get teach students to uh, 
give them several sources of knowledge of information and have them decide what they think and then and then kind of lead them they they get they lead themselves in the direction that you want they want if anyone else in the school gardens team wants to jump in oh, we're only letting one one at a time oh for now. okay so short um, on time but the second I part to... i think i want to say just quickly is that uh, gardens are more than just a place to get your hands dirty i think jimmy said that i think it's really important and that um that taking not just gardening but then talk about other things like food security and what's its link to climate change and soil quality and and just dig dig a little deeper pardon the pun i know um i'm so overjoyed to see all of the knowledge that is coming out here and i don't want to be stifling it and it's hard for me to do so i also know how tired everybody's eyes can get when they've been on the computer for two straight hours um, and I want to encourage everybody to keep this conversation going because it's something that we can keep doing after this conference. Um, the whole purpose of the C teams is to give everybody a chance to talk about these things regularly and they're pretty low commitment. So the usually a, one meeting a month at most, um, sometimes less. So please do sign up for these teams on the evaluation form and keep the conversation going. Um, so the last one is uh, art and sustainability education, and then we're going to give the floor to Donna. Who from art and sustainability education could give a report back on this? These sorry, things? I was on mute. It's oh, me. Sorry. <laughs> I was talking and I muted myself. Um, it's um, just a quick comment, though, because you you mentioned keep keep the conversation going. I was wondering if we will have access to all the participants or emails or names or whatnot, just to keep, you know, to share our, our contact information to keep some of the conversations going. Yes, that's what the C teams are. Yes. So join the C teams. OK, perfect. So and we I, talked. I took a note of everybody who was in each one. You're going to get a personal invitation. Right on. Thank you. Um, we talked about uh, we we. Again, like the other other speakers, we would have really liked to talk more, more time. But um, we talked about Atlantic salmon programs um, and how it's easier now to connect with people and work together and share resources over, you know, virtually and whatnot. We didn't dig, dive into the art side as much as we would have liked, I think. Um, but we did talk about different resources. Um, we kind of went around the question of finding ways to incorporate art, that creativity, the the expression into our programs. Um, but we didn't have the time to go into like ideas and whatnot. But it all came down to how it's easier now to share that knowledge, resources, and work together to develop a program, for example, around salmon in schools and to, to be able to share that with other school. So I hope I, I did the group justice in resuming all of that. Amazing. So um, on the note of keeping in touch, please remember that uh, everybody is very encouraged to join the C team um, or create your own if you see a need or have an idea. Um, and please email me if you have any other comments, questions. We have an evaluation form to share in the chat. Um, please do fill out that evaluation. It really helps us with our funding um, and helps us to maintain these programs. Um, so please do fill that out. And um, at the end, we are also going to be creating a conference report, which you can read. Um, so just make sure you stay in touch and that's the best way to keep the conversation going. And with that, I would love to give last words for today to Donna. Hi, hi everyone. Um, it's uh, it's there's a couple times I had to uh, um, uh, step out. My my son's here and uh, um, he's he's got cystic fibrosis. So uh, anyway, <laughs> I just had to go and, and talk to him for a second. So um, I apologize if I missed some, but I want to tell you intention uh, from everyone that. Um, we're willing to um, to really uh, improve, you know, on uh, how we're going to work together, um, uh, education, and so I'm just very grateful that we're brought together. There's a reason I feel that uh, this should this should continue. 
because in our culture, we're told sitting in that circle, not one person has all the answers. Everybody has a gift of some kind. Everyone in that within that circle has something to offer. And so we share with one another, you know, I'm not the expert on computers, I'll tell you, you know, but there are many people that are. And, uh, but we all have different gifts. We all have different talents. And then when we, when our, when the uh, students see this, they will also um, reflect that as well so that they can see their, their value, their worth, how they're going to bring it together. And I want to say what I really liked today too was uh, someone asked a question, which I was going to, have you ever asked the, the students themselves? My son, um, they're, you know, in our community, they're applying to the health center and youth center. They're applying for all these programs. And um, then my son told them, uh, have you ever asked us, he was just younger than me, have you ever asked us youth what you think is important? What, what we feel is important, what we think we should, we should be, um, be doing. So they formed their own council. And I think some of the, some of the higher ups felt a little bit intimidated by that thinking they're going to take funds away from them. No, they did it on their own. They met regularly. They, uh, it was really amazing. They just took the initiative. They just took the lead and met on their own and formed their own youth council. So I really feel that the, this is the generation we're told in our prophecies that it's the children of the seventh generation that as they learned to listen to their spirits, uh, they will bring back all that was lost and they will know what to do. So the young people, they don't have these horse blinders. You know, they don't just see one way. They're very open. They're very, very open and they're very intelligent. So on that note, I, I feel that it's an honor for all of us to be working with the youth and now an honor to work together on this issue. And I hope we uh, continue. Uh, relationship building is so important. And um, uh, I just, I'm just very grateful that this is happening. So on that note of gratefulness and our culture, we're told that it's always uh, important to, um, to, to give thanks. Whenever we do an offering prayer, whenever, we, whenever individually, each and every one of us, whenever we pray for something, whichever way we pray, all prayer is good. Say, for, for example, somebody's sick in the hospital. Or when those prayers are answered, it's always so important for us to give thanks as well. And when we talked about food, we are told that it's always so important to give thanks for our food and to share our food. We're told if we give thanks for our food, we share our food, we'll always have food. So I guess leaving you uh, with uh, that spiritual food, spiritual thought. So I'm going to give thanks on behalf of all of us in my language to offer this prayer to the creator. And, um, and, and I wanna tell you that when we go back to our traditional ways, it's not a religion per se, it's a way of life. And anybody can come join us at our powwows, at our ceremonies, you know, because uh, it's spiritually based. So, um, and we all have a spirit. So I'm gonna offer this on behalf of all of us, offer this to the creator, uh, in whichever way you understand him as well, him or her, the spirits of the east, south, west, and north directions, and Mother Earth, who sustains us and gives us everything that we need. May wish we dodge when I sit a moti, Mishuajish, Volalia. How Chibanuk, Chamish and Lil Tonada, Volali Tandoma Valia, Volali Chinan Jana, Nujina. At Volali, particular Kugus or Nakidas on the Gisil Yago. How could there's no Chamish and Lil Tonada, Chijamichi Tandi Nada, Volali Tandoma Valia, Volali Tandil Quilia, the Kiloko Guswan, the Gisil Yago, Akidas one, make me dead neck, Volalia. Hard Kisnuksa with Kamishkish night and Nemo Nadio, Nadio Danago said what I said. Volalik Nago and the Yakuvia Tang Nemo Volalik Tawedabek Sophia Volalik Chilano and Dalia Vajad Via, Daniel North Tier, Volalia, Volalik Negis Kutandel Mavidaya, Mongo Sophia, Alia. Ha, oh, I look at me shall look to Nadio, Volalik Chikoko, Keloko, Gosanga, Akidas on Bagis Ruego. Volali can piss and don't you guard it, and she would all do it until you not come along with that as you get in the media. Volali. Hagish no amico, Volali Kishma amico, Sweg in the Munich. Sanguan, Gundal, Minishko, 
Quisis Nimesh Kam Sakoda Nimaji. Walali Kishni Matniko. To the Creator, Spirit of the East Direction, South, West Direction, which includes our ancestors, all of our ancestors, North and Mother Earth, we give you thanks. And I thank all of you for being here, uh, that we all gathered today. And um, I want to say Absodnogamak. In our language, that means all my relations, or we are all related. Uh -huh. That was great. Donna, can you teach us how to say thank you in, in Mi'kmaq? Sure. We say, I heard you, I heard you say hey, walale you a lot. This word, the, um, this word is the most important word in any language, how to say thank you. And so in our language, we say walalin, okay. like well as, in being, a lot of us well as in being well. La as in the first uh, part of a French word, and Lynn as in somebody named Lynn. So we put them all together. Well, Alin. Well, Alin. Well, Alin. Well, Alin. That was excellent. Well, Alin. Oh. Well, Alin. Mm. Well, Alin. Oh. Well, Alin, everybody, for coming today. Yeah, and well, Alin means thank you to all of you. So I would say to well, Alin, to all of you. Well, Alin is for one person, but to all of you, we say well, oh. Have a great day, everybody. And a great Bye. Day. Thank you. And thank you. Hopefully we meet again soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.